Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 95 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm gonna be ranting away at you, uh, talking about things important to me and I think deserve your attention. Um, as always, if you have any reactions to the show, email me, whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website, uh, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there. As always, if you do email me, please include something like uh, left side of the aisle or something like that in the subject line so I know it's not spam. Okay, with that, let's get to it. Uh, first, whenever I can, I like to start with some good news. So here's some good news to start with. On Monday, as one of his last acts as Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta announced that the DOD is expanding the military benefits available to gay and lesbian military couples. The Pentagon hopes to be able to offer these extended benefits by August 31st. The list of expanded benefits includes education, hospital visitation, casualty notification, travel, transportation, ID cards, family counseling, relocation assistance, recreation programs, access to base facilities, and more than a dozen more. Now, the list does not include uh, health care coverage for same-sex spouses or um, on-base housing privileges because of limitations imposed by the infamous Defense of Marriage Act. But uh, Pentagon officials are saying that they're actually trying to see if they can do something about housing without running afoul of the law. The Pentagon estimates that there are about uh, 5,600 active duty and about 3,400 National Guard service members who are part of same-sex couples. Uh, Panetta said, quoting him, while it will not change during my tenure as Secretary of Defense, I foresee a time when the law will allow the department to grant full benefits to service members and their dependents, irrespective of sexual orientation. Well, happily, Mr. Secretary, so can I. Going from there to uh, one of our regular weekly features, the clown of the week, given for meritorious stupidity. Uh, and it's good to, I put it here because it relates to what I was just saying. Sullivan, Indiana is a town of 4,200 people in the southwest part of the state. There, a group of parents, teens, and even a teacher at Sullivan High School uh, is fighting for a separate traditional high school prom that would ban gay students because these people just don't think it's right that they Actually, they're not very clear on what the problem is, other than that they think this, that it, assuming this is being gay or lesbian, it is offensive to us. The thing is, among those supporting this plan, which was hatched at a church meeting on Sunday, February 10th, one of the people supporting it is Diana Medley. She's a special education teacher at the high school. She not only compared being homosexual to being what she called one of my special needs kids, she insisted that being homosexual is a deliberate choice and that gay and lesbian students have no purpose to their lives. Now there is pushback. Um, a Facebook page, Support the Sullivan High School Prom for All Students, has appeared. It already had a thousand likes like in the first day or two that it was up. Now, one of the students involved in the plan for a no homos allowed dance uh, said, quoting, we want to make the public see that we love the homosexuals, but we don't think it's right, nor should it be accepted. Yeah, right. I love you, you abomination in the eyes of God, who I can't even stand to share a high school gym with. Yeah, funny way to show love. Then again, <laughs> what do you expect from a collection of clowns? All right, going on from there. Uh, something I don't do enough that I, I think I, I would like to do more of is follow-ups uh, to things that I've talked about before. I don't do enough of that, I think. So I've got a couple of follow-ups here. Uh, five weeks ago, I gave Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa a Hero Award, which is we give occasionally here for people who just do the right thing. I gave it to him because he was the only liberal or so-called progressive in the United States Senate who voted against that supposed budget deal at the end of the year, the deal that was going to save us from the mythical fiscal cliff. 
Karkin accurately described this fiscal cliff as a manufactured crisis and said that the deal, again truthfully, he said the deal benefited the richest at the expense of the poorest. He also mocked those who want to redefine the middle class as people making $400,000 a year. Tom Harkin is an old-style populist uh, from a time when the term actually meant something worthwhile. He has announced he will retire at the end of his current term in 2014. Now, I can't say I agreed with Tom Harkin on everything or even on a lot of things, but he is an honorable and decent man at a time when those are in short supply uh, in our national politics. He will be missed. All right, next up. Four weeks ago, I talked about the case of Aaron Swartz. He's the internet wunderkind who uh, committed suicide as he faced trial for 13 felonies for trespassing into a computer closet at MIT and downloading a bunch of articles from an online uh, database of scholarly journals. Well, I said at the time that this case was one of gross uh, offensive prosecutorial abuse and overreach by the U.S. attorney from Massachusetts, whose name is Carmen Ortiz. I said that the intent of the case was to make Swartz their scarecrow, the person they would use to scare others. I also said that Ortiz was thinking of running for governor and that I wanted people to remember this case if she ever did. Well, it now develops that, according to an article in the Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly, state prosecutors had intended to let Swartz off with a stern warning. The Middlesex County District Attorney had planned no jail time, quoting the article here, with Swartz duly admonished and then returned to civil society to continue his pioneering electronic work in a less legally questionable manner. The expectation for what is, uh, was for what's called continuance uh, without a finding. That is, the charge is held in abeyance, and if the person can keep out of trouble for some specified period of time, usually a few months, sometimes it's a couple of years, uh, the charges are dropped. That's what was expected. That's what was planned until Carmen Ortiz seized control of this case and turned it into 13 felonies. Remember this case. And as a footnote to this, it's also worth noting that last July, the Boston Phoenix gave Ortiz, uh, gave Ortiz rather, its top muzzle award for the year. This is given for violations of free speech. In this case, it was for prosecuting the case of Tarak Mahana. He was convicted of giving material aid to terrorism, sentenced to 17 years in prison, totally and entirely for things he said and wrote, not for a single thing he actually did. Remember, indeed. All right, finally, two weeks ago, I know that the Boy Scouts of America, the BSA, is expected in the near future to announce uh, a, a decision to rescind its ban on gays and scouting. Well, to no one's surprise, the BSA has driven the right wing BSC. And if you don't know what that means, email me and I'll tell you, but know for now that the B stands for bat and the C for crazy. For example, some 42 wacko groups uh, ran this ad in USA Today, calling on the scouts to maintain the ban uh, and claiming the change is being considered only because of the threatened loss of corporate support, which is actually rather funny coming, uh, considering the fact that about 70% of scout troops get much of their support from church groups, many of which are threatening to withdraw their financial or logistical support if the change goes through. In fact, uh, the public policy agency of one of, these, uh, one of these churches, the Southern Baptist Convention, signed the ad. Now, there are three particularly disgusting parts of this ad. The first is the wild claim that criticism of the BSA's bigotry is an attack on free thought. This is a standard trope of the right, really. I mean, call them out for their racism, their sexism, their homophobia, their bigotry, their greed, their stupidity, their callousness, their whatever and they will screech that this is a violation of their free speech. Their claim at bottom is that they get to say whatever they want and nobody is allowed to object. All right, the second bad thing is the assertion that banning gays, that this bigotry is a moral principle, the ad says. But the third and the last is the worst. It's the second half of that third paragraph up there. 
This makes reference to the so-called perversion files that the Boy Scouts released last year. The group had kept a secret list of people banned from scouting because of having molested some scouts. Now, it kept this list secret. It never informed any authorities. It was entirely secret. The ad mentions this and mentions this list and then says, and I'm quoting, how will parents be able to entrust their children to the Boy Scouts if they trade the well-being of the boys for corporate dollars? In other words, this ad is making the old, the bigoted, the paranoid, the utterly false connection between homosexuality and pedophilia. It is totally, completely untrue, totally bogus without a single shred of evidence to back it up. But the right wing will continue to use that fear in order to deny gays participation in society. In fact, you don't believe, you want this even clearer that this is what they mean? Brian Fisher, he's the director of issues analysis for the American Family Association, a group which signed the ad, uh, recently said that ending the ban on gay participation in the, in, in the scouts would mean that pedophiles will soon be, quoting, bunking down with your kid at Jamboree. These people are both incredibly vile and mind-bogglingly ignorant. Then again, those two qualities often go together. All right, we're going to take uh, oh, uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to be back in just a minute. Here we are back again, and uh, a couple of more things for this half of the show. First, we're going to talk about guns. Uh, again, I've been doing this every week, probably still another couple of weeks more. But this week about guns, it's going to get like a little history of the Second Amendment, if you will. But to do this, actually, we're going to go back before the Second Amendment. Or in fact, we're going to go back before the Constitution. We're going to go back to the Articles of Confederation. They were uh, adopted in, uh, uh, seven, uh, drafted in 1776. They were adopted in 1781. Article 6 of that uh, document required, quoting, that every state shall always keep up a well-regulated and disciplined militia, sufficiently armed and accoutred, and shall provide and constantly have ready for use in public stores a due number of field pieces and tents and a proper quantity of arms, ammunition, and camp equipage. And notice here that those guns are in uh, public armories. They're not all in private hands. The Constitution now was drafted in 1787 after the Articles of Confederation proved hopelessly inadequate to bind these states together into a single nation. It, was, it went into effect in 1788, the Constitution did. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, uh, a listing among the powers of Congress, says, and I'm quoting, to raise and support armies, but no appropriations of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the, laws of the Union, suppress insurrection and repel invasions, and also to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. Now note first, this means the Second Amendment was not the first time in the document that this militia business is mentioned. Also note that the clear intent here was to rely on a militia to execute the laws, suppress insurrection, and repel invasion while avoiding the dangers to a weak and fledgling government of a uh, standing army. Now the Bill of Rights was drafted by James Madison in 1789. Uh, it was one of the issues was there was continuing concern over the possibility of a standing army. So Madison offered a guarantee that states could, could continue to have militias. That was the Second Amendment. And this is by the, the by now familiar text of that amendment. Significantly, however, this was the original proposed text. Notice the clauses are flipped. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, a well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country. But no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. There is no way that any rational sane person can read that text without recognizing that it was specifically referring to a militia, not to any gimme my guns bull. 
Firearms have been regulated in the United States as long as there's been a United States. Laws bearing the carrying of concealed weapons were passed in Kentucky and Louisiana in uh, 1813, in Indiana in 1820, Tennessee and Virginia in 1838, Alabama 1839, Ohio 1859. There were similar laws in Texas, Florida, and Oklahoma. In 1893, the governor of Texas said the, the mission of the concealed deadly weapon is murder. Now, while people were allowed to have guns at home for self-protection and um, while they were like out in the prairie where they might need protection from animals or bandits, uh, frontier towns usually banned guns from being carried around inside the town limits. A visitor arriving in Wichita, Kansas in 1873, this is the heart of the wild, wild west, would have seen signs declaring, quoting, leave your revol revolvers at police headquarters, get a check. No later than 1876, Dodge City, Kansas had a gun control law. This is a sign that was on the front, uh, on Front Street in Dodge City in uh, 1878. The carrying of firearms strictly forbidden. By 1882, the law had proved inadequate, and, but the, re, the reaction to people was not to say, oh, in that case, we need more people carrying more guns. The response was to pass a stricter law that banned anyone except county, city, or United States officers from carrying any pistol, bowie knife, slung shot, or other dangerous or deadly weapon. Tombstone, Arizona, banned the carrying of deadly weapons in 1881. In fact, part of the cause for the famous gunfight at the OK Corral was because the Klan and McClurry brothers would not surrender their guns. Now, getting to the Supreme Court, the first important court decision, Supreme Court decision, about the Second Amendment was Presser v. Illinois. This was 1886. The Supreme Court there found that the Second Amendment only restricted the federal government and that states were free to impose whatever restrictions they wanted. Uh, that decision was affirmed in a case called Miller v. Texas in 1894. Now, this is before the idea of incorporation, the idea that the protections of the federal constitution applied to the states as well. So these decisions don't really affect our current legal status, but they do add further proof to the fact that gun control laws have been in existence in this country from the beginning and upheld by courts. Now, the next big case, and this is the important one, was United States v. Miller. This was in 1939, and a unanimous court upheld the Firearms Act of 1934, saying that there was no conflict with the Second Amendment. What the court said, I'm quoting the court here, in the absence of any evidence tending to show the possession or use of a weapon of the sort that was involved in the case has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia, we cannot say the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep and bear such an instrument. With obvious purpose to assure the continuation and render possible the effectiveness of such forces, the declaration and guarantee of the Second Amendment were made. It must be interpreted and applied with that end in view. That is, the guarantee under the Second Amendment was about militias. It was not an individual right. It was one reserved to the people as a whole. For 69 years, that was precedent. For 69 years, it was relied on by, by local courts, by lower courts, and even referred to by the Supreme Court. For 69 years, that was the legal standard. Until 2008, when our current reactionary Supreme Court, in the case of District of Columbia v. Heller, by the narrowest of margins, five to four, created out of thin air an individual right to possess and keep guns. So when people like Scalia and Alito and Thomas and Roberts claim that they're interested in original intent and plain meaning and how much they respect precedent, never forget they are lying through their teeth. And the blood of thousands of victims of gun violence is on their hands. There have been, as of about noon on Tuesday, just short of 1,800 people killed by guns in the United States since Newtown, 12 of them in Massachusetts. All right, our last thing, um, our other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Now, 
As I'm sure you've heard, NBC News got hold of and released this 16-page white paper, which outlines the administration's rules for drone strikes against Americans abroad. Reading it is like reading an essay designed to illustrate Hannah Arendt's famous concept of the banality of evil. By its very cold, legalistic language and its attitude, by having everything filed and orderly, by replacing consideration with procedure, it looks to whitewash its actual meaning. That meaning is this. We of the White House, we on the inside, we get to kill our own citizens abroad based solely on our own say-so. You, Congress, the public, we don't need your involvement, we don't need your permission, we don't even have to tell you, and we don't even need evidence. Now, you think that very last part goes too far? You think I'm overstating the case? You think, like many, that only the bad guys are actually going to get hit? Unthink it. Consider the very title of this paper. This is the title of the paper. Lawfulness of a Lethal Operation Directed Against a U.S. Citizen Who Was a Senior Operational Leader of Al-Qaeda or an Associated Force. All right, first off, just what's an associated force? What does it take to be considered associated with Al-Qaeda? The document never says. Uh, and how do we know who's, uh, that the person who is about to have a bomb dropped on them, and let's face, that's what an armed drone really is, dropping a bomb on somebody. How do we know they're a senior operational leader? Well, an informed high-level government official says so. And when, to get, when can this person be killed? Well, when they pose an imminent threat. Oh, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Uh, wait, though, what does imminent mean? Turns out that in White House world, imminent doesn't necessarily mean specific or immediate. No, the memo declares it has a broader understanding of the word imminent. In fact, it says that if that supposed uh, informed high official decides that the targeted American has been recently involved in activities posing a threat of a violent attack and there is no evidence suggesting that he has renounced or abandoned such activities, that's enough. That's all the evidence that they need. The memo does not define recently. It does not define activities or what would be required to show a renunciation of such activities. In other words, they don't have to have any evidence of an actual threat at all. Now, when this business started to appear, it was actually three years ago, in the spring of 2010. And at that point, I wrote a letter to the White House. Never got an answer, which didn't surprise me at all. But I wrote a letter to the White House, and I'm going to read that letter. It's dated April 8th, 2010. Having been out of touch for a few days, it was only last night that he became aware of the reports in the New York Times and the Washington Post that you had ordered the targeted assassination of Anwar al-Awlaki. I noted that the reference were not to capturing or even kidnapping him to bring him here for trial, but to um, assassination. The question arises, Mr. President, just who the hell do you think you are? Who do you think you are that you could order the cold-blooded murder, and let's, not, let's be honest, that's what we're talking about here, the cold-blooded murder of an American citizen. An American citizen who has been convicted of no crime, had no day in court, but is to be stabbed or shot down or ripped to shreds by a bomb based solely on the kind of intelligence that has served us so well in the Middle East from the fall of the Shah to supposed weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Mr. President, just who the hell do you think you are? You are claiming for yourself a power and authority that even the Bush administration, that shredder of the Constitution, that underminer of privacy and civil liberties, that embracer of torture, that invader of foreign lands without justification, even the Bush administration did not claim this power for itself. The power to order on your own authority, subject to no oversight and no need for proof beyond your personal belief, the murder of American citizens. It's bad enough that we even talk about targeted assassination. Bad enough that we openly embrace methods for which we previously denounced our ideological enemies and hypocritical enough that we will still denounce them for those same things. But with this action, a bright red line is to be crossed, a line that once crossed can't be uncrossed. If the official 
uh, the officially sanctioned cold-blooded murder of an American citizen, someone supposedly protected by constitutional guarantees of due process, at least from their own government, even if they're outside the U.S. Guarantees that apparently evaporate in the face of the all-powerful mantra, terrorism. Mr. President, just who the hell do you think you are? Once that line is crossed, where do you draw a new one? How can you draw a new one? Bluntly, Mr. President, if some future administration approved a domestic targeted assassination, how could you object? Because domestic is supposed to be different than foreign? That kind of absolute distinction was supposed to apply to American citizens. If the one can be ignored, why not the other? Once that bright red line is crossed, what is to prevent the slippery slope? What is the impenetrable roadblock on the path to the, to the targeted murder of some future administration's domestic political opponents based on their claim that they are a threat to the nation? And if that seems far-fetched, just remember it was not that long ago that an administration embracing torture or one ordering the murder of an American citizen would have seemed equally unthinkable. Mr. President, I say again, just who the hell do you think you are? Because now, when we see these memos, and remember, this, mem this is not the actual classified legal justification. Again, that, that's still classified. Some members of Congress have seen it, but we still haven't seen it. This is an unclassified summary of the argument. What we see is something that I, that I have to describe as, that frankly I, I cannot not describe as, the acts of a tyrant. Now, no, I'm not saying Barack Obama is a tyrant, but I am saying this is the act of one. Presuming to yourself, with no oversight, no checks and balances, no counterweight, arrogating to yourself the power, the authority to assassinate, to murder a citizen based solely and completely on your own unchallengeable, unquestionable claim that this person was an enemy, can you, can anybody give me a better example of what you would call tyranny? This is the act of a tyrant. And the fact that we as a people are even considering this, that we as a people are actually discussing this seriously as if this was a rational idea. Oh, I may disagree with it, but I understand. No, we shouldn't understand. We're supposed to be better than this. And every single day, we prove that we're not. I'm out of time. I'm out of here. You have the best week you possibly can. And um, I'll see you next week and hopefully have something better to tell you.